Always alerting, always protecting. Welcome to This Week in Kansas with your host, Tim Brown. Hello and welcome to This Week in Kansas. Thank you for being with us this morning. Governor Sam Brownback has signed Senate Bill 7, which will provide funding to schools through block grants. The new funding model replaces the state's 23-year-old funding formula. Susan Mosier, acting secretary of, of the KDHE, gave testimony that helped stall a proposal to expand Medicaid. Mosier's testimony gave a dramatically inflated picture of the cost of Medicaid expansion from earlier estimates. Critics say Mosier's testimony was an intentional effort to kill the proposal. Got plenty to talk about this morning. We're going to start with this school funding uh, plan, Senate Bill 7, which was signed by the governor. And this is a, uh, a departure from, again, what we have seen for the past almost 25 years. Right. And, I mean, obviously for the last 23 years, we've had a rather convoluted formula, but it was convoluted on purpose because they were trying to accommodate all sorts of different variables, building size, distances uh, that school buses have to run, uh, you know, low-income students, uh, students with, uh, you know, handicaps, uh, special needs students, all of these different things. The move to block grants is two different things. One, it's a way to lower overall costs in the short term, because we already know education is taking a hit, and this way they're going to hold on to that, and it's going to be a way for them to preserve it for the rest of this fiscal year and into the next year. But m even more important than the move toward block grants, I think, is what's going to be happening in the meantime, because presumably, you know, they're going to use these two years to come up with a formula that will be significantly different from the formula we currently have. They obviously want to dramatically change that formula. They weren't prepared to make an argument for a total change in the formula, so they fall back on, you know, one of the classic modern conservative tropes. Let's go with block grants where we're going to bundle the money instead of delivering it directly to schools and we'll send it to the districts and they'll decide how to spend it. Um, this is a fallback position that's going to hopefully I think in the eyes of some of the people who voted for it distract voters, distract teachers and others from really important work that they're going to be doing behind the scenes. Chapman, the, the block grant idea on the surface really doesn't sound that bad to me. I, I, I know some people have pointed out some, some potential flaws with it, and I know some districts are actually trying to, to block the block grants. What's the problem with this? The problem with it isn't the block grants in and of themselves. Most districts would like a new formula, and so that, that kind of stopgap measure and the possibility that there may not be a new formula in two years and we may be forced to perpetuate block grants or even worse they can't come up with anything is i think the specter that's hanging over a lot of these uh, school districts uh, what they really don't like about it is the fact that it's going to uh, cut uh, about 140 million dollars in spending that would have gone directly to classrooms and to school boards as base state aid per pupil. And when the governor says that we're spending more on education, what we're actually spending more money on is CAPERS funding for retired teachers, their retirement accounts, and their, uh, their benefits. It's not going directly to the students, to the schools themselves. So while they have more leeway under the block grants, they're getting less money to play with. Chapman's exactly right. I mean, the reason why it was convoluted, one of the reasons why it was so convoluted is because they were really looking at who are the pupils in each of these schools and what are their needs and let's try to come up with some sort of formula that will accommodate for that. Uh, you know, the block grant idea, obviously some people might find it appealing, but it's a way for people who obviously want to dramatically change things to kind of hide the dramatic changes that they're going to be working on. I, I got the email from the governor's office, the, the initial news release on this when he signed the, the bill earlier this week. And one of the things the governor says, and Chapman talked about this just a moment ago, is that uh, for the first time ever, we'll be spending over $4 billion on, on K-12 education in the state of Kansas, and it's going to increase the next two years under this plan. And, 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 and really touts this as we're putting money back into the classroom. But uh, obviously the, the criticism is that that's not 100% 
true? Well, if you don't have a formula that is guaranteeing that these block grants are going to follow where the pupils are and be addressed to their specific needs, you know, as Chapman points out, there's a whole lot of other big ticket items that could easily absorb these lump sums that are handed out. It's not a way to guarantee that you're actually addressing specific educational needs within classrooms. Now, Chapman, the three panel judge has, has sent out signals, I suppose, saying they may actually block this from happening. First of all, how can they do that and how likely do you think that is of actually happening? It, it, it may actually happen. And let me actually f fill in on one more thing uh, from what Russell is saying you know, just there, is that there are problems with the uh, formula that's going away. Let's, let's put some perspective in here. When the largest and best funded school district in the state is getting declining enrollment money, there's a problem with the, the formula. This just may be going too far, which is what brings us back to that three judge panel. Mm -hmm. um, it, consider how the state legislature has been taking a number of shots at the judges uh, with not only selection but uh, the bill that was uh, just introduced that would broaden the legislature's power to impeach judges. I have a feeling that we're looking at a bit of a standoff <laughs> between the legislature and the, the uh, courts. So they may actually decide to enjoin this block grant, especially with the Schools for Fair Funding folks having uh, filed suit against it earlier this week. Uh, I'd say it's better than 50-50 that the, the courts are going to get involved. Now, if the courts do get involved, what happens to the session then? Are, 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 would a, a special session be possible to, to try to, because it doesn't sound like business will be finished at that point. No, we're probably looking at overtime and whether it's a special session or whether the existing session extends further, you'll see some fast and furious work on this should the courts get involved even if the legislature decides, as they kind of had with Gannon so far, to decide we're just going to tell the courts, you have no enforcement mechanism, we're not going to enforce it, you have your ruling, that's all you're getting. Um, that there's still gonna be some kind of action on the part of the legislature, so they probably will be working into June uh, then, but it almost becomes a bit of a political gotcha game between the, the two entities, because the legislature has surely shown at this point, they have no interest in enforcing these decisions from the courts with which they disagree. And Russell, that, I think that's a great point, because even, even this bill, I think is a, a, a very open, sign to the to the courts that we're going to do it our way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Chapman said it, it has the potential to become a political gotcha game. I would take a look at this bill and say, we're already there. <laughs> We've been there for a while. I mean, nobody who reads the news can possibly misunderstand the level of animosity and distrust that currently exists between our state judicial establishment and uh, our legislators in Topeka. And, and you factor in just the overall budget challenges that we're facing. In fact, you know, I, I was looking at some of the, some of the things that are being proposed uh, just, just this week, which would include tax increases, which, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the Republican lawmakers say they won't, they won't support. Uh -huh. And, you know, surprisingly, you even see some movement on the idea of, you know, maybe slowing down some of these treasured income tax t yeah. cuts that they've put forward. Um, but I, I don't think that that's enough to head off uh, a deepening of uh, this game of tit for tat that's going on between two branches of our government, three branches of yeah. our government, actually. Yeah, three. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's take a commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk about Medicaid expansion. Very interesting week with all the action happening there. We'll be back. Natural born leader, the Audi A6, named to car and driver's 10 best. Where are they? Experience the spring of Audi sales event today and get exceptional values on the Audi you've always wanted. 
you know the quality of our Mennonite crafted dining room furniture, now it's available even for your bedroom. Smooth opening, full extension drawers, English dovetail construction, no snag finish, and liquids leave no stain. Looking for high quality oak, cherry, or maple bedroom furniture, look no further than the furniture store of Kansas and McPherson. Choose from one of our many finishes, free delivery and financing available. You're going to love the Mennonite quality handcrafted bedroom furniture here at the furniture store of Kansas and McPherson. All right, welcome back. Medicaid expansion is something we've talked about for the past couple of years, and it's a huge issue here for the state of Kansas. There was uh, a, s a couple of hearings, actually, this, uh, this past week that were uh, hugely attended. In fact, uh, I was talking to some of the folks that were in. Well, we had Jim Ward on last week. He was uh, part of that. And I was also talking to some of the folks, that were, other folks that were in the uh, committee room, and, and uh, they were estimating over 200 people were, were involved in that. So it was a really significant hearing, and it was interesting to see the shift in attitude with a lot of Republican lawmakers. Chapman, I want to start with you on, on Medicaid expansion this, uh, this time. We've had a, a pretty radical change, though, just from those hearings last week to, to this week, and a lot of that has to do with uh, Susan, Susan Mosier and her testimony. And uh, some of it is uh, going to be rhetorical. Um, you know, the, the governor and the administration um, know that there's at least some kind of desire among the public for the, uh, or the Medicaid expansion in the abstract. The problem that we run into is a great distrust of the federal government's willingness to comply with its part of fully funding and then mostly funding uh, Medicaid and this expansion um, into the future. There's also some political angling here because a lot of this is tied in with Obamacare. And of course, no one on the Republican side, especially here in Kansas, wants to be doing anything that seems to be friendly to, amenable to, or advancing the case of Obamacare. So sometimes it's just political, but there's also this great distrust that the federal government is going to very quickly drop the amount of money that it contributes and this state is in a very, very tight budget situation. Even coming up with the 10% that the state would be on the hook for is going to be very hard when we've just been talking about how tightly pitched even K through 12 education is. So if you take the 10% and suddenly you're talking about maybe $350 million, well, that's exactly the, or almost not even the amount of money that the Gannon decision uh, said should be added into K through 12 education. If the state can't find that money, where are they going to find it to to fund uh, Medicare and Medicaid or Medicaid expansion? Excuse me. Just from a practical standpoint, if you read Insight Kansas this week, my colleague Dwayne Gosen talks about the moral aspect of it. That's separate from what I'm saying here. I'm yep. just talking about the practical money side of it, which is I think why you're seeing a lot of hedging. Well, and, and, and Chapman, I got to say, I, I agree with Dwayne's uh, thoughts on this from a moral standpoint. I think it's it's. I think it's only right, and I think it's the only way to go. And I, I know I understand that's not where what you're talking about, and, and you may feel very differently from a moral standpoint, as as far as as opposed to a fiscal standpoint. And Russell, this is interesting. Part of what I have a, a problem with in this testimony, and specifically Susan Mosier, the, the numbers that she was putting out there are, are vastly different from the numbers that we've heard from from other lawmakers and from from uh, uh, various various entities because she's bundling information in there specifically this waiting list for adults with or for people with disabilities which quite frankly if you go back a couple of years at the the onset of can care was caused by the governor's plan mm -hmm. to have this this size of waiting list so right. to me it's very disingenuous to say well we've got to bundle those costs in there to take care of the waiting list that we caused uh, and and this is why we we can't do this and i just i just think I, I, I think it is absolutely disingenuous and it's disingenuous in a couple of different ways first of all uh, you know the, the points that chapman makes about the potential obligations that will rest heavily upon the state you know perhaps within a fairly short number of years if medicaid expansion goes through you know they're entirely legitimate but then yeah. again the way the affordable care act was written presumably you were going to have these actions that would be taken in terms of the insurance market and subsidies providing there so that you can reach in and you can capture these people that are otherwise dependent upon medicaid now of course that depends on all of these different gears functioning and when you have a 
uh, political party in a majority that are deeply opposed to doing anything that seems like you're friendly to the president, uh, some of those parts aren't going to function. And so it's kind of a, a matter of, yeah, there's some genuine fiscal concerns here, but those fiscal concerns are partly created because we're unwilling to take seriously the whole package of the law that's being presented before us. Yeah, no, and, ahead, and then right. as for the waiting list, um, you know, those are you know, legitimate obligations that mm -hmm. the state has taken on. But to bundle together different categories of obligations and turn that into an overall fiscal argument about a very specific and tried and true federal program like Medicaid seems to me like a, a real political stretch. Chapman, I want to get your thoughts on a couple of points that I'm about to make, but before I make them, I, I'm going to say this, and I've said it on, on many shows, I don't think this is any secret that my, my actual employer is Via Christi, so I want to get that out of the way, and I'm speaking from some experience that I have there. I'm not speaking for Via Christi at all. I want to make that very clear. These are my personal opinions. Um, two points that I want to make when you talk about the fiscal situation. We already have money that's flowing out of the state right now in the form of taxes that we are paying, uh, that, that hospitals gave up some of the reimbursement costs for, for Medicaid in the first place when, when right. the Affordable Care Act was, was put in place, whether we wanted to or not. Uh, that money's flowing out of the state uh, through our tax money. It's going to other states. They're, I assume they're using it for Medicaid, their own Medicaid expansion. There's also a fiscal advantage to, to business, these, these health care businesses, not just Via Christi, but health care businesses all across the state that will, uh, will have money flowing back in. So, so there's got to be, I mean, there's gotta, that's got to be factored in as well. I, I think that's the point I want to make. It, well, I'd argue with you about the, the tax issue because most of the <laughs> federal spending that's been going on is debt spending. Yep. So the, the tax argument only goes so far. I think that what you're saying about uh, the health-related businesses and so on is a little bit of a, uh, a stronger argument that uh, you can make there, Tim. Okay. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why. I mean, it's, it's not like everybody that showed up and that crowded into the committee room were people that were talking about their own struggles with uh, obtaining health care coverage, their need for Medicaid, and those sorts of stories. They were representatives from health care businesses. They were representatives from hospitals, organizations that work on behalf of the industries that serve all of these medical care providers. You know, there's a lot of business interests that are in favor of this, and that's part of the reason why you've seen some conservative governors elsewhere, not necessarily in Kansas, change their mind about Medicaid expansion. Well, and I will tell you, there are conservative lawmakers that have changed their mind here in the state of Kansas. I, mean, I can't, you know, I, I, that, is, that is a fact. I, I do know that for sure. The, the other interesting thing, and I, I go back to the moral part of this, and, and I know that's not really what we've, we've been arguing this morning, but I am going to make a point on it. There was testimony from, I believe it was a 21-year-old uh, woman who has uh, MS, and, and she is in that, she, she is employed, I believe, and she's in that gap mm -hmm. where she doesn't have coverage, and and it's she's like 133 percent over the poverty yeah, line. Yeah, and, or and I, like I, I I can't remember all of the details on it, but it's it's one of those areas when you you see a story like that and you think, in our country today, a person like that not being covered, I think is a crime. I agree. All right. Let's take another commercial break because I know we're way behind in the show. We're going to talk about an abortion ban that was uh, will be signed, I believe, by the governor coming up here in two minutes. Nobody, nobody. And I mean nobody sells Tempur-Pedic mattresses for less than the furniture store in Kansas and McPherson. The best-selling bed in America just got better with the addition of the Tempur-Pedic Air and Super Cool Breeze Bed. Nobody. Uh, nobody. Nobody has a bigger selection. We don't just stock catalogs. You can comfort test any Tempur-Pedic here. And free financing, free delivery, free setup, and free removal of your old mattress set. Nobody, nobody, nobody sells Tempur Pedic for less than the furniture store in Kansas in person. No matter where I'm going, I can always depend on my Honda. And at your Kansas Heartland Honda dealer, you can get a great deal on a new Honda right now, like the 2015 Accord for just $199 a month. 36 miles per gallon? That'll save me some cash. Huge deals on Civic, just $159 a month. Everything I want comes standard. You should see the touch screen. When America's most trusted brand comes with spring deals like these. Why settle for less than a Honda? See your Kansas Heartland Honda dealer today. There is a new bill that would restrict a common form of abortion, and I believe Kansas would be the first state in the country to restrict this form of abortion. But, you know, it's interesting. We, we were talking before the show, and before we get into de details about this, Russell, I, I really want to um, make the point that we haven't heard much about abortion this session. It, it's, it's not that bills haven't 
been offered and, and, and are in the works, and the governor will certainly sign, he's made the statement before, he'll pretty much sign anything that restricts abortion that's mm -hmm. put on his desk. He's very, uh, very open about his feelings on that. But we just haven't heard much about abortion this session. Well, I mean, I think the answer is exactly what you just said. The governor's very open about it. We have a conservative Republican majority in both the Senate and the House, and a great many of them have long been active in pro-life efforts. They're very open about it. This doesn't necessarily surprise people. And the focus of news is always the thing that will surprise, that will shock, that wasn't expected. Yeah. The idea that, you know, having one really big uh, in the last election, they wouldn't go forward with, uh, you know, anti-abortion measures. I mean, that would have been the actual surprise if stuff like this never made it out of committee. Yeah. Chairman, is it, are we just so used to it here in the state of Kansas that there's just kind of old hat and we've got bigger fish to fry, so to speak, from a new standpoint in the legislature? It, it's, a, it's a largely pro-life state. Um, and it, we're, we're fairly used to these things, so we see them. Plus, our attention's been drawn by all of the issues with the budget and so on. And if there's one thing that, uh, that we know in political science, it is that when the economy is first and foremost on people's minds, they're not as interested in legislation like this. So the, the media attention, the public attention isn't there. The uh, amount of abortion-related legislation is not increased or decreased. It's kind of standard. It's just that our attention is elsewhere. So when this comes through, we're thinking, oh yeah, there's also this piece of legislation coming through. Uh, this is a, uh, Chapman, the, the one thing I was kind of curious about, this is a bill that was introduced by Pete DeGraff, and I, I thought we had already hit the deadline for, for new bills, but I, I understand this is, uh, it was actually introduced to the House Committee on Federal and State Affairs, which is actually exempt from the, mm. the, uh, the deadline. So that's, that's a little, uh, uh, little piece of uh, fact or trivia that probably a lot of people didn't know. I certainly uh, didn't know that. Yeah, I've heard that uh, that kind of legislation called a blessed bill uh, before, and there, there are certain parliamentary standards that you can satisfy with bills that will get them above the line uh, even after the uh, the deadline. And uh, that's been this. It, they've been talking about this for some time. I know that Senator Garrett Love from Montezuma had been involved in, in this legislation in addition to uh, Pete DeGraff. Yeah. Russell, not, uh, no big surprises here. This will likely, I, I think, has a pretty good shot. I, I think, the, oh yeah, it'll, uh, the governor will sign it. It'll become law. Uh, the interesting thing will be what happens afterwards. This is, as you pointed out, uh, a new type of legislation. They're specifically targeting an abortion procedure, mm -hmm. mostly that's used during kind of the late second trimester. Um, that is an area in which, you know, under the basic terms of Roe v. Wade, states can, in fact, get involved in legislation. Uh, you know, some years ago, there was a huge discussion about partial birth abortions, which is a very rare procedure, but the primary one that's used when you have third trimester abortions. Uh, the state of Nebraska wrote a law to outlaw those, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court shot it down. A few years later, they wrote an almost identical law, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court accepted it. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this one. All right. Let's take another commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk about candidates' names on ballots. We'll be back in one minute. Chevy trucks always find new roads to conquer. We started with a family of the most dependable, longest-lasting, full-size pickups on the road. And now, introducing the pickup that unanimously won the 2015 Motor Trend Truck of the Year. All made of high-strength steel, only at one place, your Chevy dealer. Now during Silverado Truck Month, get a total value of $7,750 on select Silverado 1500s in stock the longest. It's Silverado Truck Month at your local Chevy dealer. It's Customer Appreciation Month here at Jabara's Flooring Superstore. Our customers appreciate our low prices and huge selection, and we appreciate our customers. This month, you'll find special bargains throughout the store. Come in and browse the flooring specials. Carpet, wood, laminate, and tile. Discounts and special prices in all departments during our Customer Appreciation Month. This is the perfect time to get your new flooring. So come see us today at Jabara's Flooring Superstore on North Broadway. And welcome back after the big situation with Chad Taylor this uh, last election cycle. Chris Kobach decided he would write a uh, bill that would limit the ability of candidates to actually be taken off the ballot. And, and I think Chapman, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the initial draft of this, uh, the candidates pretty much had to die, I think. And uh, that was about the only way they could get off the ballot. 
He, that's right. And he, it certainly was about the Chad Taylor and uh, 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 Orman situation in the, the Senate race last year. Uh, not really surprising uh, that there would be some retribution from uh, uh, from uh, Secretary of State Kobach, or maybe not retribution, but considering that loophole that Kobach didn't uh, approve of and didn't like, um, it, this just cleans up that problem so they don't have to deal with that again. Um, and uh, that's about all that the, I think there really is to say about it. It doesn't uh, necessarily restrict the Kansas ballot that much more than, than other states. And uh, we won't notice much of a change of that Orman Taylor situation. That was you know once in a generation. Yeah, you know Russell, that that was a uh, I think an anomaly. And you know I guess when I when I read this initially, I'm, I'm thinking I don't really see the the, the huge issue here. If yeah. if we want to make it a little more difficult to get off a ballot so that people can't you know pull hijinks. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean somebody might want to yeah, make some okay. sort of grand principled argument about how, you know, the whole point of representative democracy is for uh, whoever the voters want to be there on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you could make arguments about how, well, then restricting, you know, candidates' appearance on the ballot and requiring them to file by this time and then locking them in, that gets in the way of representation. But by and large, the rules we already have serve those general principles well. Uh, as you say, this was an odd situation that arose out of the fairly unique political circumstances of the state of Kansas and the dynamics of the 2014 elections. Out of the many, many things that uh, Secretary of State Kobach has involved himself in regarding who has access to the ballot and who can vote, this one is pretty small potatoes, I think. Yeah, I, I it was interesting. It, it was it was interesting in the in the whole context of the of the the last race. But but I, I think I, I've got to agree with Chapman. I just don't I don't think we're going to see many more like that. Oh, and, no. and the funny thing is, you know, after all was said and done, it really didn't matter anyway. I, I mean, I think that was the, the there was a, the, the big worry by some folks that it. Would I, have. I wonder if there would be uh, more stress and angst about this particular bill if. Orman had, in fact, won the Senate race. Oh. Uh, you know, I don't know what more they could have added into it. It's pretty plain what they're doing now, but yeah. I, I suspect that there would have been a bit more uh, fulmination. Well, i got to say, the, the initial uh, ordinance, or I think it was an ordinance that was, that was written that uh, Secretary of State Kobach was trying to use, I agreed with him the way it was written. It sure looked to me like... Uh, the secretary was in the right. I don't agree with him with, on a lot of things. But I, I was, I mean, I was really surprised. I was genuinely surprised that the state Supreme Court said that, uh, you know, Taylor could drop off. I, I mean, you know, it was a silly argument to make because, oh, he didn't exactly use these specific words in this specific way. But then again, that was the law. Yeah. I was surprised that they ruled the way they did. Real quickly, I think we've got about a minute, minute and a half left. Uh, the, uh, the governor was shown on television during the Wichita State game, the last game, and was was booed, and people were commenting on the shirt uh, or his politics. And it wasn't the shirt. Yeah, I, it wasn't the shirt. Might have been the pink shirt underneath the T-shirt. That's, that's well, no, okay. No, it's don't do it's that. one people who just okay. generally speaking don't like politicians, and so there's the governor. Let's boo him, and then there's the fact that uh, you know he doesn't have a particularly good reputation with college students because he's not exactly doing a whole lot to make the life for Kansas universities a whole lot better right now. Kind of a rough, uh, rough uh, couple of days for the governor. I would say so. All right. Interesting things. We will, uh, I think, next week, if uh, things work out the way that uh, I believe they're going to be, we're actually going to have a, be back to one hour for next week, next week only, and uh, we will look at uh, the mayoral race, and we'll talk with our candidates uh, here in Wichita about uh, why they want to be mayor here in Wichita. And that ought to be an interesting one. So please tune in for that, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for being on the show. Very much so. Chapman, thank you for being on the show, and we appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions or comments, please email me at thisweekinkansas at cake.com. Hope you have a wonderful week. Introducing Bundle Deals, 